Greetings, everyone. Welcome back to the Tea History Podcast. Lazo Montgomery here with you once again, this time with episode 14, More Zany Antics in the American Colonies and with the British East India Company. Over on the other side of the world, when the future Americans and their British masters were slugging it out in the colonies, the Qianlong Emperor was in the middle of his long reign. Some might argue overly long reign. You'll recall from episodes past that the first half of Qianlong's reign was was good, and the second half could have been better. By the time he died, 1799, same year but different month from George Washington, his 15th son, the now Jiaqing Emperor, he had the losing trifecta of the White Lotus Rebellion, Miao Rebellion, and an empty treasury to deal with. In 1793, The famous McCartney mission is going to come and go without success. And after attempting the soft sell, now Britain was going to have to force this trade on China the hard way. And in the 19th century, they will begin to position themselves for the ultimate collision course that would culminate in the Opium War and the subsequent Treaty of Nanjing and everything else that followed that most famous of unequal treaties. But the thing about the Opium War is that it's sort of misnamed. The root cause of the Opium War wasn't Papaverse Omniferum, or Opium. It was Camellia Sinensis, the very subject of this podcast show. I maintain, to be more accurate, this should have been called the Tea War, not the Opium War. Why is that? Well, you've perhaps heard it before in high school or college history, and in an old CHP episode on the Opium War not to mention in the History of Hong Kong series and that Qing Dynasty overview, the thing that made the whole mechanics of China trade so odious was that the British traders were forced to put up with this hated Canton system. This had been put in place by the Kangxi Emperor back in 1687. The Qianlong Emperor in 1757 made things even worse by forcing the foreign traders to all deal with the Hapo and the whole corrupt Kohong down in Canton. These were the officials appointed by the emperor to have exclusive rights to fleece the foreign traders and make them pay a little extra to carry out commerce in China. You know the whole boilerplate story. The British didn't have a whole hell of a lot of commodities or luxuries to sell to the Chinese to offset the massive amount of tea purchases required to satisfy the home markets. As the 18th century ended and the 19th century began, the British Isles had become thoroughly and hopelessly addicted to this beverage. And having a grossly unfavorable balance of trade with China... England couldn't offer enough to offset the tea purchases. Therefore, they had to pay the shortfall in silver bullion, and it was wrecking the economy. So in order to reverse this grossly unfavorable trade balance, the East India Company started dumping all this made-in-India opium into the Chinese market. And opium, when used as a narcotic drug, like all narcotics and opioid drugs. Not that I've ever tried it or anything, but I hear it's very addictive. And that was indeed the case in China. And widespread addiction to opium predictably followed into the first half of the 19th century. So Indian-grown opium took hold in the China market amongst the richest and poorest citizens. That balanced things out nicely with respect to the tea trade. And so widespread was the opium use in China, silver bullion reversed course and was now flowing in the opposite direction, out of China's economy and into Britain's. And now, with the tables turned, the Qing government had to figure out some way to halt this disastrous trade imbalance. Now, I don't want to repeat the whole tale of Lin Xu and retell the story of the Opium War again here, but suffice to say... When the Daoguang Emperor put his foot down and demanded no more opium be imported into China, Britain's response was, well, (laughs) the Opium War. And when that ended, and after China had been soundly defeated, what followed was the Treaty of Nanjing, the first of many Bu Ping Deng Tiaoyue, or unequal treaties to follow. And believe me, even though this happened 18 decades ago, In the minds of many people in China, leaders and common people alike, 
It's like it happened yesterday. And with this treaty, the East India Company finally had what it had always wanted, the end of the Canton system and their very own base of operations to carry out trade. And this base was, of course, the new British Crown Colony of Hong Kong. So although we know this historical incident is the Opium War, it's safe to say that, had it not been for the trade imbalance due to the tea addiction of the Europeans, there wouldn't have been such an urgency to dump all this patna opium in the Chinese market. Well, opium war, tea war, doesn't matter. The outcome still reverberates into our 21st century times. In 1823 something ominous happened when the British had discovered tea growing wild in Assam. It's going to take a long time to figure out how to turn this indigenous Assam leaf into a marketable product, but figure it out they did, and in the next couple episodes, we'll see how they accomplished that. Prior to the Opium War and subsequent treaty, in 1834, the East India Company had lost its monopoly on tea. And even with the loss of this monopoly, the company had still resisted trying to take advantage of their favorable situation in India to explore whether tea, their number one business far and away, could be cultivated there. But with the market evolving like it was, still going nowhere but up, the British East India Company lit a fire under that notion. And growing tea in India on a mass scale started to get more serious discussion. By 1844, following the opening of all these treaty ports in China as a result of the Treaty of Nanjing, 53 million pounds of tea had been shipped to England. Now, before we move on to early efforts to cultivate tea in India, let me quote again from James Norwood Pratt, the new tea lover's treasury, about the final legacy of the East India Company. This has always been one of my favorite bits of his tea writing, he said that the company had come, quote, to be hated and loathed by smugglers and consumers alike as a symbol of corrupt, complacent monopoly. But it also founded the cities of Calcutta, Bombay, Singapore, and Hong Kong. It hired Captain Kidd to combat piracy and made Elihu Yale a fortune with which to endow a university. Its corporate structure is the model for all joint stock companies to this day. The Stars and Stripes were inspired by its flag. The typical New England church, patterned after its London chapel, and St. Petersburg modeled on its shipyards where Tsar Peter the Great had worked incognito. It created British India, caused the Boston Tea Party, and kept Napoleon captive on its island possession, St. Helena. And this long-standing effort and enterprise was chiefly paid for by tea. The company's fortunes came to rest on products destined to go down the drain in Europe and up in smoke in Asia. End quote. James Norwood Pratt, ladies and gentlemen. A lot of people had discussed this for years, giving a go at planting and cultivating tea in India. The more the years passed, the more viable the project became. But too little was known about the tricks of the trade. Too many things remain secret that only the Chinese seem to know. I mentioned already, turning Camellia sinensis leaves into tea is not an intuitive process at all. We already saw how many centuries it took Chinese tea farmers to figure out the secrets. And even with the opening of the treaty ports and foreigners running around in these cities, all the secrets of manufacturing tea, the way they loved it in Europe and elsewhere... Well, those secrets were deep in the mountains and hills, distant from these newly opened cities. And we're going to get to this next time. This period in the history of tea, the 1830s to the 1850s, this was also the age of the China Tea Clippers and the fabled annual tea races every April. This was a race between the first clipper ships sailing out of the ports of Fujian to England. Whoever was the first to market in England with the freshest, first flush tea of the season, the most prized quality of all, would reap a fortune and prestige and premiums paid for their product. These ships were fast enough to make the voyage non-stop in about 85 days. A quick word about the flush. 
this is the most expensive and sought after part of the tea plant. A single flush equals the flower bud and the two youngest leaves. The leaves below the flush are still used, but the flush is the most prized and contains the freshest of flavors. On a lot of these online tea sites, you'll see this word a lot. How many of you might remember this period of the China Clippers and how they were portrayed so memorably in James Clavell's book, Taipan? Not only was this period in history the time of Dirk Struan and the Noble House, it was the peak time of the Yankee Clippers, the China Clippers, Donald McKay, James Baines, the British Tea Clippers, the Thermopylae, the Cuddy Sark, and the Great Tea Race of 1866. The history of tea during the late Ming and throughout the Qing dynasty was a raucous one. China still held a very strong competitive advantage, well, having a monopoly and all. To engage in the tea business with them, the China tea merchants dictated very favorable terms for themselves and took very healthy profits along the China side of the supply chain. But as unfavorable as the trade terms may have been for the British, now, thanks to the opium trade, once again, tea was an immensely profitable business for the East India Company, and by extension, the British exchequer, who got a piece of that action for a long while. China had enjoyed a nice monopoly on the world tea supply. In the 19th century, during the reign of the Daoguang Emperor, someone we'll look at next episode, is going to carry out a little industrial espionage financed by the Honorable Company, the good old EIC, to steal not only the hardware for producing tea, but the software as well. There was a very strict ban in place during the Qing dynasty prohibiting the export of live tea plants. But despite this ban, for the first time since the most ancient days of Shandong, 2737 BCE, China's monopoly on tea, and more importantly, the secret manufacturing process, was about to be broken. Again, all for next episode. Tea by the time of the mid-Ching is totally recognizable to us. Tea bags haven't been invented yet, and that won't come until the 1920s, but loose-leaf teas sold in a surfeit of beautifully designed tins and porcelain teapots and teacups of Chinese design and chinoiserie were as common as sugar and milk in most parts of Europe, and certainly in the UK and our colonies. In the kilns of Jingde Jun, down in northern Jiangxi province, were going full boat throughout the 19th century, supplying the worldwide demand for their wares. You know, in our 21st century world, we can choose from hundreds of the perhaps thousands of different kinds of teas made around the world. Choices abound. But in the days when Westerners were all clamoring for tea in China, the 1600s clear through till the end of the 1800s, they didn't have as many choices. I mentioned Bohe tea as the standard benchmark black tea of its day. There was also Kangu, which was considered a step up in quality. I think I mentioned Kangu tea was what many of us know as the dark Kung Fu tea. Let me mention one more prized tea from back in the day. And if you've never tried it yourself, perhaps your grandmother or great-grandmother, if she wasn't a member of the LDS church, that is, might have had this in her pantry. It's called Lapsang Suchong Tea. In Mandarin, this would be pronounced Li Shan Xiao Zhong. It's known today as Zheng Shan Xiao Zhong. It's a kind of tea from the Wuyi Mountain region where Bohe comes from. If you remember from part 11, the story of how black tea came about, well, another version of that story is directly related to this discovery of Lapsang Suchong Tea. This was during the Ming Dynasty. Same story, soldiers invaded a village where they were producing tea, and thanks to stopping production and burying all the leaves under the tarps, by the time the soldiers came and went, the green tea leaves buried underneath these covers, or tarps, had all turned black. So the Lapsang Suchong version of the story says that prior to the farmers hiding the leaves underneath the covers, they quickly dried them first, and they did this by exposing the tea leaves to hot smoke. And that's the distinguishing characteristic about Lapsang Suchong tea. It's all in the processing. The drying is carried out by burning the pinewood logs that were local to the area. 
and the smoke from this pine wood is absorbed into the leaves, and what you have is a black tea with a unique smoky flavor. So this tea also was another standard in the repertoire of teas that China shipped to the West. Today, everybody makes it. Twinings, Harney & Sons, Taylors, Fortnum & Mason, and dozens of other lesser-known, but no doubt distinguished brands. This is one of those teas that's eh, sort of an acquired taste. These smoky teas are called xun cha. To xun something is to smoke it. I wasn't a big fan at first, but I started liking Kimun tea. Remember way back in those days, Chinese sort of looked down on black teas as purely a foreigner thing, and no pun intended, it wasn't their cup of tea. I just mentioned Kimun tea. Once Kimun tea was introduced to the market, growers in China began to make black tea respectable and palatable enough to be accepted in the China domestic market. Kimun or Kimun was Cantonese for Qimen, a city in Anhui province near the gorgeous granite peaks of Yellow Mountain, Huangshan. The tea masters from in and around Qimun or Qimen put out several teas that all carried the Qimun name. It made its debut in the first year of the Guangxu Emperor's reign in 1875. Qimun is a black tea. Some call it the Queen of Black Teas and the Bordeaux of Teas. The person in Anhui who developed this tea first learned how to make Kangu down in Fujian. So he just brought the know-how back to his home in Qimen, Anhui province. And this tea goes by many names, and there were many varieties that came out of the four main growing regions around Qimen. There's Qimen Haoya, Qimen Maofeng, Kimon Kango, and others. This is, this is the only black tea in China that rose to the level of tribute tea status. And you could bet the Guangxu emperor sipped this tea as he stressed out over the state of the Qing dynasty during his watch. But it sure was popular in England. Kimon tea leaves ended up as one of the base teas in your typical English breakfast teas. You brew it at 90 degrees Celsius, 194 Fahrenheit, for two to five minutes, depending. The color of the tea, the liquor, as the industry insiders say, will have a reddish color. Depending on the terroir of that particular Kimun tea, it'll give off either a floral, fruity, or smoky scent. This is a very delicate tea, even though it's a black tea. Kimun black tea uses only the whole bud set just like many high-end green teas. That's why it doesn't look as coarse as the whole-leaf black teas. Next episode, we'll look at how the British were able to figure out the whole tea processing thing, and as a result of this, they were able to launch the Indian and Sri Lankan tea industry. That's quite a story, and rather than get started in this episode, we're going to save that until next time. Quite a history tea has, would you agree? From a bitter tasting brew sharing a Chinese character, Tu, with Ku Cai, a bitter vegetable. From those Bronze Age times to the Han, the Sui, the Tang, Song, Ming, Ti, just kept getting better and better. Because of the way geography and exploration was, at first it was all those peoples adjacent to China, where the Silk Roads passed through, who learned about tea first. When boats started sailing on the Seven Seas in the 15th and 16th centuries, Westerners, too, got to see and taste for the first time this beverage called Te on the east coast of China and Cha in the south. This was quite a dynamic and explosive age when Great Britain and the colonies so quickly fell in love with tea. Who was to know what all the future blowback would be from the Seven Years' War, the finances of the East India Company at the time, the matter of taxes derived from the tea trade, China's continued monopoly on tea know-how and technology. It's funny to see how everything was related to everything, and tea was caught in the middle of it all. As for the tea dictionaries, encyclopedias, guidebooks that give you the skinny on each and every tea readily available in the market... Resources abound. There are 
books galore that go T by T and explain about where it comes from, how to brew it, what water temperature to use, the whole works. There are books, there are tea websites, YouTube channels. I had no idea. And if this isn't enough to satisfy your soul, on top of all these resources, there are experts in the tea blogosphere who can teach you even more. Okay, class dismissed a little earlier than usual. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from Los Angeles, California, IA. Please continue to stick with the program and consider joining me next time, perhaps, for another piquant episode of the Tea History Podcast.